So let's finally look at the shapes of the orbitals. I'll bring out models in class so that you can look at and come down the front after class and kind of examine closely. Um, but for now, let's just look at the shapes on the screen, okay? So we know that the Schrodinger equations from which those quantum numbers came define these regions in space, okay? This first one that we see here is just a surface diagram of that, okay? So this is where you have a high probability of finding the electron. We came up with a boundary where the probability drops off and the s orbital is a sphere and that's what it looks like, okay? So that is its shape. So what is the s orbital? We know the value of L is equal to zero. That gives you the subshell called the s subshell. We know in that subshell there's only one orbital. That's when m sub L is also zero. And that's what we see here. With this being a 1s orbital being depicted, um, n is equal to one, L is equal to zero. m sub L is also equal to zero. And an electron that has those three numbers lives in a space that looks like that shape right there. Now, as we move further away from the nucleus, okay, so we had an n equals one, and then we have an n equals two, we have nodes where the probability of the, finding the electron is gonna drop off within that space. So it's hard to see what we have there, so let me zoom in a little bit on this first one, okay? So this is the 2s orbital. Okay, n is equal to, that doesn't look like an n to me, n is equal to two, l is zero, we're in the s orbital, okay? Notice how we have high electron density and then it, we have a space where it looks light. What we're seeing here as we go further out from the nucleus, the probability of finding the electron, okay? We have what's called a probability density and we just have the probability. Let's look at the bottom one down here, okay? Um, can't be at the nucleus, so it's zero there. We have an area where there is going to be some possible um, probability of finding the electron, and then we have a place where it drops off to nothing, and then it increases and then slowly drifts out. Now, where did this shape come from? This is a three-dimensional rendering of what is happening here, okay? Probability, boom, here dropping off here and increasing again and then dropping off where you can't have it outside of that. How do we get this shape? It's a three-dimensional rendering from the Schrodinger equations, okay? So let's pull back in and let's look at this next one. Oops, try this. Okay, so this is the n equals three, okay? And our L, of course, zero. We're still looking at an, a 3s orbital. As we look at this probability, we have where we have a probability of finding here, it drops off to zero. We have a probability of finding it, drops off to zero. We have a probability of finding it, and then it slowly renders out, okay? These areas right here are um, what we call nodal places, where you're not going to find the electron. Let's look at the p orbital, and each one of these will have that. We'll just not go into the um, examination of those nodal areas within it anymore. Let's look at what a p orbital looks like. We know the p orbital is when n equals one, and we know when n equals one that m sub l equals zero, negative one, let's start with that one, negative one, zero, and a positive one. There are three orientations in space of them, okay? There are three orbitals. One is along the x-axis, one is along the y-axis, and one is along the z-axis. So what's being represented here is that electron density map where they're just kind of monitoring where the electron is at any one time. We see that there's a, no probability of finding it in the middle, but the weird thing is that electron that lives in this orbital can migrate anywhere in that space. He's not gonna exist there, but he can be anywhere in there, and this is because of its wave nature, okay? So it's along the x-axis, the y-axis, and then the z-axis axis. Okay, so three orientations means there's three orbitals, three values means there's three orientations, there are three p orbitals in a p subshell. And that's what they look like. So a question could be, you know, we show you a picture of an orbital and say what kind of orbital is this? You ought to know that's a p orbital if it looks like this. 
All right, the d orbitals. We know when our, we have our d orbitals that these are our values of m sub l. It goes from a negative 2 up to a positive 2. We see five numbers, and we translated that as there's our, there are five orbitals. And I tell you that this m sub l tells you the basic um, orientation of space of those orbitals. Four of them look very similar. Four of them are, have four lobes. Okay, so this is not four orbitals, this is one orbital, it has four lobes, and the electron that lives in this orbital can be anywhere in that space that you see in, in there. Now this one is called the dyz orbital because it is along the yz axis. So here's my y axis, my z axis, and it is sitting in there along that axis. This has got the exact same shape here but it's along the x and y axis. So here's my y axis and my x axis, so it's kind of turned on its side. This is the d y z, okay? So you see the y z there. It is along the y axis and the z axis here. Boy, that looks like it's been drawn on the um, x and z. And that one looks like it's been drawn on the, oh no, that's y and z. Oh, it does say XZ. Gosh, I'm losing my mind. That does say XZ, so it's being drawn along the X and Z axis there. All right, now this one is a little bit different. It's along the X and Y axis, but it's in between the axes, okay? So it's along the X and Y axis, but between them. This was along the X and Y axis, but it's on the axis where these are, no, I want to say this again, and we'll say it correctly. These are between them, okay, so we have a lobe, can't do, can't draw and have it zoomed in. We have a lobe here, we have a lobe here, we have a lobe here and lobe here. They're between the axes where these are on the axes, okay? Same short shape, it's just turned. Again, Schrodinger equations are defining this shape. And when the values of M, L, and N, N L, and M sub L are just right, <laughs> The shape is completely wacko, okay? So this is the dz squared. Um, so we've got five orbitals, four of them look very similar, and then we've got this weirdo right here. But the electron that lives in this orbital can travel anywhere in that space. So that is what the d orbitals look like. You ought to be able to recognize them when you see them. The next one that we're going to look at, of course, is, oh, um, nodal plane. Do I have a picture of that? No, I just want to discuss it. All right, so the nodal plane is where you have the probability drops off to zero. So we have nodal planes in here between those lobes, and I can't draw that one very well between those lobes there. But those are the nodal planes. By plane, I mean we can actually have a three-dimensional plane that would pass right through there, and you would have no uh, probability. Probability density would drop to zero in those areas. So that electron, like I said, can travel anywhere in there but will not be located between them. Impossible to think about that as a particle. Particles don't have that nature. But it also has a wave nature and therefore that electron can travel in that space, stay in its space, and have a zero probability of being found between those lobes. Okay, so we know that in when L is 3, we're in the F subshell. Because of those numbers that we can draw, we know that there are seven different orbitals, and these are what th they look like. Four of them are similar in that they've got these eight lobes, depending upon how they're oriented, and three or more are similar, and they all look like this, but they're oriented along different axes, okay, the X, Y, and Z axes. Um, I've, I mean, they're not... There, this F is very similar to that oddball D, except that it has got a nodal plane right through the middle of it that we did not see with the F. Let me back up to the F and we'll look, I mean the D. Let's look at that D. Notice we don't have that gap that we see right here. There's no gap and plane between those, but in the F we see that plane occurring between them. That's how I distinguish between those. Now, in terms of these bits here that we're seeing describing them, you do not need to memorize those at all. Don't feel like you have to know that portion of that. Same thing with the um, Ds. You don't need to know YZ, XZ, 
x squared minus y. You don't need to know those. What you need to know is when L equals 2, we are in the D sub shell, there are five numbers we can draw, therefore there are five orientations in space, and you ought to be able to recognize them. Okay. Last little thing I want to talk about is the phase of the orbitals, okay? The phase is the sign of the amplitude of the wave. Now let's think about this in terms of a wave that you'd be familiar with, a, a wave that's just a wave on the ocean, okay? When you have a two-dimensional wave, and let me get a picture of it, okay, we can have um, the up and we can have the down, and that would give us a positive and a negative area for that wave. But when we're a three-dimensional wave, okay, um, we're going to have an also a positive and a negative. And I just mentioned this, we won't have to use it very much, but you're going to see in the images two different colors for our lobes. Um, the ones in class, I think, are yellow and red. And this one here, it's blue and it's red. And it is just showing us that same kind of idea of a positive amplitude and a negative amplitude associated with that wave nature of our orbitals. So when you see a diagram and you see them actually distinguishing out the colors, that is what they're representing, is the amplitude, the positive and negative amplitude of the wave. Um, eventually, if you are a student who carries on chemistry further down the line, these signs matter. How those waves interact to make bonds, it matters. But for now, it really doesn't matter. I just wanted to mention it because you're going to see those colors and you might wonder what they're referencing. Okay, this is the end of this chapter where we've kind of looked at the electronic structure. We started with understanding light. We looked at light's nature and from that started examining the electronic structure's nature. And we've finished by thinking about where all the electrons can exist within an atom.